Holy buzzword, Batman. Today we are talking incrementality. I know you've been hearing it everywhere. Everyone's talking about incrementality. It's the new measurement system. It's replacing attribution. But what does it mean? And more importantly, how do you operationalize this idea within your organization to affect your media positively? Well, good news. My man, Luke Austin, SVP of strategy here at Common Thread Collective is going to break it down for you. He's going to explain what it means, how to get access to it, and then how to deploy it inside of your organization for the sake of improving your media outcomes. This is the tactic series where we go deep into the exact how of how we are delivering our service for our customers, taking big ideas and breaking them down into tactical executionary bites for you to deploy inside of your company. As always, brought to you by our partners at Motion. I'll be back later and tell you a little bit more about why we have hand-selected them as contributing to our mission, helping brands produce predictable, profitable growth. But for now, Join Luke talking about incrementality 101. This is incrementality 101. What it is, why you should care about it, and how you can actually use it on a day-to-day -day basis to impact the performance and results of your direct-to-consumer e-commerce business. So starting with the overview, incrementality is the gold standard of measurement. And this handy visual here shows us in pyramid hierarchy form different measurement options that are available to all of us to be able to make decisions against. Starting from the bottom of the period, there are surveys and third-party da data. Then we get up into the attribution tier, then into the marketing mix model tier, and then finally to the experiment tier. Experiments is where geo experiments live, which is what incrementality, it informs incrementality outputs. There are geo holdout experiments, that are then resulting in an incremental read for the specific channel or tactic that is being tested. Why is geo holdout and incrementality at the top of the pyramid? The core reason is because these are scientific experiments designed at a specific point in time for us to be able to get a causal read on the impact of a specific marketing channel or tactic. Said another way, we're not looking back and just applying an MTA or attribution against historical data. What we're doing is we're setting up an experiment point in time and assessing the causal impact of that is, is the causal measurement versus correlation of layering on a marketing mix model or attribution on top of historical data. This is really important because the only way for us to get a clear sense of, let's use in this case, metas, incremental or true impact on the business performance, we need to isolate that channel within the context of all the other variables that are moving, right? So at any given point in time, we have seasonality impacts, we have product category and business specific impacts related to business strategy, product mix, category mix, et cetera, the competitor, categorical changes in the broader ecosystem within your space and your vertical. And so, there can be so many confounding variables at any point in time when if we just try to look back at historical data and use some attribution model or MTA or even marketing mix model to overlay against the historical data, it can get really challenging to parse out the actual impact of a specific action or marketing or marketing action during that point in time because there's so many other things going on. So what we need to do to get a clear read and a true understanding of the impact of a marketing investment is to isolate that within the midst of all those other uh, variables going on at, the, at that point in time. That's what incrementality and GeoLift helps to get at. So what is geo holdout and incrementality testing? No, it's the gold standard of measurement. What does it actually mean? On the right here, this visual shows really clearly broken out uh, what we're doing which is we are going to isolate a group of a group of people typically based on region DMA GMA or state isolate those users and then show media to a certain group of users and do not show media to the other group of users within that experiment so at a specific point in time we're isolating groups of customers or potential customers showing some media, not showing others media, and then assessing the impact on that specific action in that point in time. Okay, quick interruption to talk to you about motion. One of my favorite things about using motion is how quickly it gives me information to the kinds of questions I wonder about all the time when it comes to creative. 
So in this case, I'm looking at my scroll candy instance inside of motion. I can very quickly and easily see my performance across different asset types. This is the thing that brands are incessantly curious about are is how are my static images doing versus my videos versus my DPA or DABA in any given period of time. So in this case, I can quickly pull up creative comparison type report. I can look at the, how much spend on images versus videos versus DPA and DABA. I can see the ROS, the AOV across all these spectrums and begin to provide those answers back to my customer right away. This is just one of many different reports that exist instantaneously inside of Motion App that our team uses to help bring creative insights to our customers to help produce more outliers. So in this case, what uh, typically happens if we're doing a state level geo holdout is there'll be a group of states, let's call it three to five states identified based on uh, your business's revenue data. And those are the group of states that we're gonna withhold from media within Meta for uh, a four to six week time period, depending on the test design and the strength needed to get read. And then at, that, at the end of that point in time, we're gonna assess the revenue impact of not running Meta within those three to five states at, that, at the end of that point in time. And that is going to be the delta in the incremental impact from that channel. Here's a more specific example of an actual incremental test results that gives a bit more specificity to this conversation. So if you see in the bottom here, there's a control and test group, right? So the test group is going to be the group of geographies or states that were not shown media during this point in time in which this test was run. The control group is going to be business as usual, the rest of the states. In this case, we have three states hold out as the test group and the rest of the 47 states are the control group where business as usual media was run. At the end of this test, what was assessed is that there was a negative incremental revenue impact of negative $46,000 within the test group as a result of not running media within that geography. What that means is that the business left $46,000 of revenue on the table by not running media in New York, Arizona, and Virginia over the course of this test. What we can do then is that data is directly from Shopify based on those uh, three specific states. The modeled spend over that time period within those geographies was about $16,500. So the true incremental ROAS of this test output was a 2.78, the 16.5K in spend against the $46,000 in incremental revenue. On platform ROAS reported by Meta on a seven day click basis within this time period was a 2.31. So the true incremental ROAS impact measured in Shopify based on the states that were held out and the revenue that was lost was a 2.78. Meta on platform ROAS is a 2.31, meaning that the incrementality factor or incrementality percentage is 120.3%. That is the delta between on platform reported ROAS and true incremental ROAS within the test result output. So, what this is saying essentially is that Meta underreported its true incremental impact on a seven day click basis by a factor of 1.2. And so this gives us clarity on Meta's true incremental impact. And as a side note, this revenue was not actually lost. We did not miss out on $46,000 in revenue from this test because in this inverse geo holdout test setup, we excluded those three states, but we didn't have to pull back our total Meta media investment. The remaining dollar, the dollars that were held back in those three states were reallocated to the rest of the control group, the rest of the 47 states. So the revenue is not actually lost. The business risk is quite low in a good test setup. What this illustrates is that there is a delta between on-platform reported ROAS for all the various platforms and tactics that we're all running within our media mixes. There's a delta between the on-platform reported ROAS and the true incremental ROAS from that specific channel or tactic. And what our data set of tests across a number of uh, different direct consumer e-commerce stores from a number of different data sources, our tests, a test from measured house, what we've ag aggregated is that there's a very wide variance in, in the incrementality factors between each of these channels and tactics, not just platform to incremental impact. There is a delta there, but when we look meta, versus Google, Google brand versus non-brand, there's a, there's a wide disparity in terms of the incrementality factors that result from this. So the meta test that we just looked at, the incrementality factor was 120%, meaning the incremental impact of that channel is higher 
uh, than what the platform is reporting on a seven day click window. That is not the case for most channels and tactics in terms of the base mark, uh, baseline or benchmark that we tend to see. So based on the aggregate of the data set, what we tend to see is that meta retention. So running meta campaigns to existing customers and past purchasers, the incrementality benchmark for that campaign is 60%. Google non-brand is 75%. YouTube is around 75%. Google brand, 30%. And then we can go on down the line. Again, these are incrementality starting points. And on a brand by brand basis, these vary really widely and need to be validated for individual, individual brands. But as a starting point, what we can see is there's a wide difference in terms of what the incremental impact of meta acquisition uh, reported ROAS is versus Google non-brands reported ROAS is, right? So to further illustrate this, Google brand is a really good example of where this large disparity comes into play. And so let's say in this case, our AMER target is a 2.5. And what we know is that brand search based on the incrementality test that we run is an iROAS of 23%. And our on-platform reporter ROAS is a 5.7 during this time period for record. So we may look and say our AMER target is a two and a half. On-platform reported ROAS for Google brand is a 5.7. Great, we're looking good. Not so much because an incremental ROAS of 23.23%, an incrementality factor of 23% against an AR target of 2.5 necessitates that our in-platform ROAS target for Google brand be a 10.9 ROAS. So you take the 2.5, you divide it by 23%, you get to 10.9 ROAS. That's our target. We're actually underperforming. So this is why geo holdout reads from incrementality tests are so important to get clarity on because there's a wide disparity in terms of each channel and tactic and what the efficiency expectation you need to be holding that channel or tactic is to based on the incrementality result. So how do you actually go and use this on a day-to-day -day basis? First is this needs to inform how you set your channel level targets. Google brand, Google non-brand, Facebook acquisition, Facebook retention, TikTok, each of those channels should have their ROAS targets set based on what your AMER target is and then adjusting that based on the incrementality factor, like we did that math in the slide before. So what you're going to need to do is start with either the incrementality starting points while you're working through getting incrementality reads for your specific brand and use that to set the iROAS targets and the platform ROAS targets that you need from each of your specific channels. Set the efficiency expectation. It's going to be wildly different on each channel, right? But we're not going to be going for a 5X on Google acquisition and a 5X on Google brand. There's going to be a, a much wider disparity in terms of the efficiency after you adjust for the incrementality starting. So setting channel ROAS targets is critical to use incrementality as an input for that. Then once those ROAS targets are set based on the incrementality factors, how we're using incrementality is then analyzing media performance. So this is an example. The top visual here is showing us ROAS based on on-platform reported ROAS. And then the bottom table is showing us iROAS. So taking the on-platform reported ROAS and then adjusting, adjusting based on the incrementality factor. So if you look at this, uh, the table at the top of the slide, on-platform reported ROAS is, is showing that Google non-brand and Facebook acquisition are performing pretty similarly at 3.01 on Google and a 3.24 on Meta. Pretty solid. There's consistency between the two. This would not indicate that there should be large changes in the budget allocation between the two channels. But once you adjust the on-platform reported ROAS based on the incrementality factors, it's a much wider disparity. Google is performing at a 2.26 I ROAS and Facebook is at a 3.88 I ROAS a much larger, larger disparity here. And on a, a channel level, what the intended action here would be is we need to pull some money away from Google and push more into Meta. Meta is overperforming, Google's under, Meta is overperforming, Google is underperforming. There's room to find more efficiency and drive more top line outcome for the business by moving some dollars from Google to Meta. And this happens on a campaign level as well, right? Once we adjust for the incrementality factors, it's gonna show us where the wide disparities are in performance. And then the final piece is tuning an MMM or media mix model. This is sort of the last step 
and not something this is not needed to prioritize prior to the other two to the other two implications of the income totality test but the core input that is going to tune a media mix model is the results of a geo holdout test over time so as brands continue to get reads for their specific business based on individual geo holdout tests those can be used to tune the mmm and and give a stronger indication of what the budget allocation should be on a channel level basis to start the month again the efficiency target is setting the media mix expectation though right not the other way around we can start with great tuned mmm and the media mix model based on the incrementality studies is going to give us our monthly budget split at the start of the month but that is not a static output that should be evolving based on the efficiency and so the most important thing is that incrementality factors are used to set channel ROAS targets. And then the efficiency target is what allocates the budget, not the other way around. We say our goal on Meta is to achieve a 1.35 acquisition ROAS. That's after adjusting for the incrementality factor. And we're going to spend as much as we can against that ROAS target. And we'll be making adjustments along the way. So incrementality the gold standard of measurement, it is critical because there are very wide differences in the reads that we get on a channel and tactic basis. And because of that, brands need to be setting their channel ROAS targets and making budget allocation and optimiz optimization decisions, adjusting for incrementality factors. Otherwise, there's going to be money left on the table for your business.